All right, hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel or iTunes podcast, wherever you're getting this from. The topic of today's podcast is called Injury Risk Reduction. We're going to get deep into the bowels of pain and injury reduction. There's actually a bit of controversy over defining an injury. It's typically a report of uh, dysfunction, so decrease or decrement in performance, so like an objective measurement, or an accompanying report of pain. A big point too um, that's really important in this conversation is the point of acceptance. If you're an athlete who's well-trained, you're used to feeling DOMS, you understand it, but you also understand it's part of the process and I'm gonna get better experiencing this. Whereas when you experience pain, it's usually not from a point of acceptance. And yeah, just because their background's a little bit or their knees move in a little bit on the squat. From a performance standpoint, sure, you're costing them a little some pounds and bar, but you're not hurting them. Right. Where and before, it's we would say we're hurting them. It's, and it's perfectly possible to emphasize the same things from a technical execution exactly. standpoint you want if you just frame it differently. But not only is it just risk, but the attributable risk to pull out Ooh, some there we statistics. Go. All right, that's up step two. What can, what, what are the actual risk factors? What can we attribute that risk to? So right now it sounds like we're shifting our attribution of that risk away from mobility problems or from technical problems or you know moving quote unquote incorrectly, whatever that means, even though it's impossible to define. At any level of competition, you go to any gym, you see thousands of different ways of performing an exercise, uh, seemingly with low injury rates. Yeah. To be it's clear, that, that model is bullshit. Yeah. To, again, YouTube, I, I want <laughs> you to know that the people who are telling you that are lying to you. They're fibbing. They've made up their own narrative of logic that they are now feeding you at your expense. And your only option is to reject it. Barbell Medicine YouTube channel or iTunes podcast, wherever you're getting this from. We have two special guests with us here, the Barbell Medicine Corner here in Philadelphia, I'm a guest. Pennsylvania. Well, yes, I've been doing this by myself. <laughs> we have Dr. Austin Baraki, the second most handsome doctor in North America, and also <laughs> Dr. Michael Ray. What's going on, guys? What's up? Hey. Uh, okay, so the topic of today's podcast is called Injury Risk Reduction. We're going to get deep into the bowels of pain and injury reduction. Mike, you want to start this off? Let's define for our audience what an injury actually is and then go from there. Yeah, so there's actually a bit of controversy over defining an injury, but the, the best that we can utilize for research purposes is typically a report of uh, dysfunction, so decrease or decrement in performance, so like an objective measurement, inability to play, inability to compete, or an accompanying report of pain. That's typically how we're going to see this. Yeah, I think Timka 2014 is this the sports medicine journal that initially like reported this definition. It was like a deformity that causes a no noticeable objective decrement in performance yep. uh, or uh, 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 presence of um, some you can't do an activity it was like their biggest thing. But still, even they were like hemming and hawing around like, how do you yep. define yep. what an injury actually is? And uh there was some suggestion that anything under uh, like the ICD-10 heading of like poisonings or injury, you know, yep. like <laughs> it gets interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like if you got sucked into an airplane propeller, like effect that would be an injury. Uh, well, <laughs> this is probably getting <laughs> a little outside the scope of our audience's experience. I think Mike and I were batting a lot of these ideas around yesterday. We were looking at that paper and looking at a few other papers uh, kind of discussing this uh, this topic of injury. And he mentioned that the, I think the part that we can generally agree upon is the idea that if you have a loss of function um, or a decrement or a decrease in your performance in whatever your sporting task is, then sure, we can kind of get on board with that as being a definition of injury. But the latter part of the definition that he cited where he said an athlete's report of pain is I think where things can get a little bit more tricky. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into that a little bit. So uh, maybe before we move forward, defining pain without necessarily going into the whole pain discussion, but yeah. kind of <laughs> scraping the surface of that. Scraping the surface. I'll try to keep this brief. Um, so if we're going to define pain, the best way we could do it would be the International Associations for Study of Pain, their definition from 1979, which in essence defines it as 
um, the potential uh, or actual tissue damage that can occur with a, a negative emotional response to it uh, would be like the broad stroke of that definition. And then it's been revised several times since then. Um, but in essence, if I were to synthesize it down to this one kind of concept, it would be threat perception is in essence the definition of pain. And then you have behavioral and emotional responses to that threat perception. Yeah. So for anybody in the audience who is not necessarily very keyed up on this or not necessarily followed a lot of the stuff we've discussed previously, I think that might be a radical concept to some sure. folks. The idea that, you know, a lot of people have come into the scene, maybe from a very mechanical perspective, analyzing the barbell lifts using physics and thinking about the body as a machine and things like that. And that's not at all how, you know, pain neurobiology works. And so we talk, we've talked about this a bit elsewhere. This is the subject of a lengthy lecture that both I have a version of it. Mike has his own version of it yep. um, uh, in terms of a lecture discussing pain, not as something that we uh, necessarily sense from the tissues as pain, but it's something that our brain produces in order to protect us. Uh, and it does that based on its assessment of what's going on, which can include numerous variables in our environment. And when it perceives threat, it may uh, ultimately output pain in order as one uh, possible protective mechanism among many others that comprise the threat or stress response. Um, and so I think that's something that takes, you, you have to chew on it a little bit if you've never heard it before to understand and probably need to dive a little bit more into it to, to really get it. Yeah. But for those who have been maybe keyed up on this stuff or have heard us discuss it before, and hopefully you're kind of tracking this, this concept of pain as an output of the brain instead of as an input to the brain. The reason that we found this interesting when we were talking about this topic yesterday is basically this, that if we're going to define an injury as something that results in a decrement in performance or loss of function, cool. We said that's we agree with that. However, if we're going to include um, pain as part of that definition of an injury, the issue is that we see people all the time who kind of interpret their pain in different ways. Sure. Um, and so you can have somebody who might have some pain in their knee or their hip or their back or something like that, and they may make, they may say, "Oh, I have this ache. It doesn't really bother me. I can train through it. It's not really affecting my performance, and I can keep going." And if that's the case, then we're not really seeing a decrease in performance or a loss of function there. The example I gave is for the last five weeks leading up to nationals, I had pretty significant pain in my mid back, just to the inside of my right shoulder blade. And it bothered me every time I squatted and every time I pulled, but it didn't result in the weights on the bar going down. Weights kept going up. Performance was fine. I went to the meet competed. And afterwards when deloaded substantially and kind of recovered a bit more, from the overall cumulative stress, it, it ended up going away. So was I actually injured during that period of time if I did not observe or experience a loss of function or a decrease in performance? Conversely, you may have other folks who interpret their pain as a sign of damage or a sign of uh, impending doom, or they may catastrophize about it. They maybe have a lot of fear associated with it. And as a result of their interpretation of that pain, as a result of what that pain means to them, that the consequence of that may be a, a decrease in function or a decrease yeah. in performance because they're afraid of what it means. So they might take weight off the bar and then you see a decrease in performance and say, Oh, I'm injured. So it's almost like I'm injured because I think it gets, I'm injured. It gets tricky. Like you're yeah. injured because you think you're injured. You're, you're self selecting your, your exercise or your sport on your own. So you're reducing your own performance, but that may be an unnecessary reduction in performance. Yeah. As, yeah. as part of your own kind of protective response to right. what you're, to what you're experiencing. So, makes this whole defining injury thing yeah, kind of tricky if it's if there is like obviously like a fracture that you can't train around or you can't perform through right so if you're a pitcher and you have a fractured arm like your performance no matter how hard you want, it, you want it to be true yeah. your performance is going to go down but if pain results in you kind of self-selecting like yeah. you said or reducing your performance out of fear of the, about the meaning of pain then you kind of put yourself, you, you kind of rule yourself into the definition of injury, if that makes right. sense. You become injured because you believe that to be true, whereas it may be a situation where maybe we don't need to be quite as worried about it. Right. Which brings up the concept of when does pain matter and what do we need to do about it? How do you, we, you, how do you start to navigate that discussion with people? Yeah, it's a tricky question. I think um, it's usually a process of elimination when someone's like, does this pain matter? Well, first we have to roll out everything that would make us have cause for concern. Mm -hmm. And then once we rolled all that out, we say, well, in this case, 
pain is more of a protective mechanism. And it can be in all cases, but in this case, we don't want it to be overwhelm us where we're decreasing our activity in a fear avoidance behavior manner. So we need to keep engaging the activity consistently, but to a tolerable level with understanding in our heads that pain doesn't equal tissue damage and, and it doesn't ever just equal tissue damage. Mm -hmm. And I think once we reframe that for people, we have a different premise to operate from, it's less threatening to you. So. Yeah. Similarly, tissue damage doesn't necessarily equal pain. On no. the, you know, back and forth. The, re the relationship is, it goes both ways. So, right. so yeah. I was thinking when you guys first were talking about this, like straight up, just, okay, decrease in performance and potentially pain. I'm like, oh, DOMS then is effectively an injury. It yeah, is. If be. you exercise and do muscle damage. Yeah. Like, and, and I talked to this with a lot of people about this, especially remotely, is like when we talk about um, pain from the tissue damage perspective, well, every time you exercise, if you're doing it appropriately, you exercise and do muscle damage. If it's a novel stimulus, you're probably going to get delayed onset muscle soreness out of it. And so this is your perception of damage. But where that crosses over to suddenly I'm in pain and I'm injured is very individualistic. Sure, a sure. lot of people could suffer the same workout and not think of themselves injured. Yeah, even and that, I mean, a lot of that has to do with previous. So, so right off the bat, somebody who is very in this biological cause, you know, sort of realm would say, well, yeah, the person who's well trained, you know, they're not going to uh, be potentially at risk for developing a you know, DOMS induced injury as somebody who's untrained. And the reason for that is not only previous training experience, like literally you adapted to previous training right. load, but also you've proven to yourself that you're not as fragile right. by doing the task, surviving and saying, ah, that wasn't actually so bad. So that your predictive processes that are going on with, okay, how bad is this going to hurt, you know, two days from now, or how bad is this muscle soreness going to be? You've already had a kind of a glimpse into the future and you, yeah. you get to adjust whatever your initial perception was. Well, so. I think a, a big point too, um, that's really important to this conversation is the point of acceptance. So if you're an athlete who's well-trained, you're used to feeling DOMS, you understand it, but you also understand it's a part of the process and I'm gonna get better experiencing this. Whereas when you experience pain, it's usually not from a point of acceptance. And so you don't think you should have to experience it. Right. Which is a really important part of that conversation. Especially if you don't wanna, not only do you not necessarily accept it, but you're under the guise that all physical symptoms that I can experience must have some sort of organic pathology right. that's crea Underline. creating them, which is kind of essentially the root of the biomedical model that we talk yeah. about, where all symptoms have a cause, you treat that root cause, your symptoms go away. Well, it's right. nice and neat and tidy, doesn't really work that way. Sure. But if you're, if, you're under that, if, you, if you're under that impression, or if you are following, uh, say, social media therapy gurus who say you have to find the root cause, you have to avoid things that hurt, and you have Chase to fix, fix the tissue or, yeah. or, or things like that, then those are people who end up coming to us potentially years later, as I know we both have had among some of our kind of rehab folks that we've worked with. And they're like, I've been trying, I've, I've seen this many PTs, this many chiros, they're all telling me that this or that or the other thing, all different things are broken and, you know, maybe reframing this thing and getting back to my normal activities and reducing my fear and loading things appropriately has fixed this faster than any of that other yeah. stuff failed to do when I was rooted in that wrong model. Don't you think it's interesting that like, you know, the all the these other practitioners would potentially say that doctors, you guys only treat the symptoms. We're gonna try to treat the root the cause. Right. Yeah. But their root cause is a biological mechanical problem yet failing to address the psychological and social inputs to the, yeah. this pain experience therefore not treating the entire patient by definition leaves out the human aspect of treatment altogether so in reality they are just treating the symptom whereas <laughs> the we are trying to treat the person yeah. isn't it interesting that we've arrived back here <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have talked about defining the injury like defining what an injury is defining pain and kind of what what like separates separate something from injury versus just you know standard uh sort of training related experience or um what are like the traditional injury risk factors that you know you commonly hear about and what what sort of evidence do we have to uh, to support them as far as injury injury prevention goes yeah so we were talking about this earlier just trying to like and i'm so far removed from it it's tough to even think of like the bullshit that people kind of spell off about like oh you should have done this and i would have prevented that injury from happening but uh, i know stretching is a big one people are like oh you should stretch before exercise and that was around for quite some time still here yep we've tried to debunk it we've published an article on it recently um, sure. it just keeps coming back in new forms and right. new new packaging per you know periodically yeah i think yeah um, 
and it gets it, it seems that it's just getting more and more specific that oh it's because you didn't stretch this muscle right sure. the imbalance or, is it was there. the wrong ROM one or this right. t- this yeah. this yeah or this specific <laughs> structure this specific muscle is tight which just excluding the impossibility of diagnosing such a thing reliably you because a physical yeah. exam even though we like to think we have all these special tests that will let us isolate supraspinatus from infraspinatus or, or whatever hip flexors were terrible at actually isolating those things and and, and and interpreting the uh, subjective findings because they're not even objective when we examine right. folks of, of those tests. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of the way that it keeps getting newly packaged that this is like my pet muscle. So sure. I'm the psoas guy or I'm Blue the guy. Well, yeah. you said it. <laughs> I'm the multifidus guy. It's <laughs> yeah. deep in there. That's you don't really know. Multifidus guy. Yeah. <laughs> multifidus. Yeah. So stretching's training. one. We've we've been talking a lot so, recently, and there was a thread that recently came up on our on our uh, on our forum about the role of technique. Mm-hmm. And this one is yeah. bound to ruffle some feathers, I think. Jimmy's are rustled already. Good. Good. Because you know it just doesn't. If because we're uh, accused of just saying nothing matters with respect to this and I would like to double down (laughs) today's daily double is me doubling down. So just to reiterate our position on technique and its role at preventing injury as we've defined it, I find the current evidence to not suggest that there's any role for any particular technique in either developing or avoiding an injury as far as we can uh, define it and further defining what good and bad form is lacks any sort of real meaning. Um, And if you you can't define those things, then you can't really even say you're yeah. just a moving, it's a moving goalpost, right? Yeah. I think so. the argument is predicated upon the idea or the concept that there is a correct or an incorrect way to move. Yeah. And this is similar. I mean, if for anybody who read the recent article on that we did on scapular dyskinesis, this is just a zoomed out bigger version of that discussion. The sure. idea that there is a correct or an incorrect way for your shoulder blade to move. And if it moves incorrectly, it predisposes you to injury. That hopefully was sufficiently debunked there and has been, uh, I think, fairly consistently in in the evidence and so i think that same that's effectively the same argument just applied to the rest of the body in the same way yeah Yeah. in the same way that we don't know if there's a or or we 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 can't say there's a correct or an incorrect way for the scapula to move there are just a huge variety of ways that it moves there are adaptations that take place in a sport specific or an activity specific manner and people tend to move in a way that represents an adaptive method or it's like a style uh, way to optimize Right, yeah. their own kind of their own uh, combination of like comfort and performance and things like that in the context of the sport. variation. Yeah. yeah, so you can say the same thing for the way someone's hip moves and the way someone's knees move and the yeah. way their back moves and the way to cho- the way they choose to pick something up and things like that. And I know that I know the uh, you know this has been discussed. I think uh, you know Jared Hall and his and his podcast. They were talking about yeah. this recently about like putting people in movement jail, like saying like, this is the, yeah. these are the, these are the limits of correct movement that you must stay between and you should not venture outside of them. Otherwise you should risk it's, some, something bad happening. It's a big part of kinesiophobia. Like we're constraining movement, you know, it, which is interesting because we have to have research that says we should allow movement variability so, to, 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 with learning. But to be clear, when you say kinesiophobia, what exactly do you mean just for our audience? Fear of movement. Right. Yeah. Just, so if somebody theoretically said that like doing front squats was going to be bad for you. Right. You know, or if you let your knees do a certain thing at the bottom of the squat, that's bad for your knees. Or you don't perfectly hip hinge or set up to pick something up off of the ground. You round you your back when you round deadlift. Round your back through the deadlift. Because every time I go to move something at my house, I make sure I'm in perfect spinal alignment, right? Like yeah, so. I actually am the opposite. I just make sure that I'm fully flexed. <laughs> well, I mean, I've pointed this out before. It's like people don't seem to bat an eye when they watch someone do a 400 pound Atlas stone lift. Right. Uh, but you use the same mechanics to pick up a barbell and everybody loses their minds. And everyone, we need yeah. a Joker meme yeah. right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you had somebody who has been given a position of authority in somebody else's life who are say, saying these things, they are setting this expectation of either injury as defined, uh, you know, by decreasing performance and the experience of pain due to one of these quote unquote mechanical processes but a lot of this is manifested by this fear that has been instilled into them. Yeah. That had they had this, uh, you know, alternative uh, universe, uh, 
Where someone did not give them that, they wouldn't have had that same experience. They do a squat, for instance, and their knees cave in a little bit. And somebody who they felt was important and knew their stuff said, if your knees cave in, you could have knee pain on the inside because meniscus, right? right. And then they do that. Right. And they're like, I do have it. I have it now. You're giving people problems to fix. Like they probably would go on about their life and think nothing of it, you know? Well, that's, you know, you've preemptively framed it for them in, a, the in a threatening way or in yeah. a way that they yes. perceive as threatening, which results in more pain Correct. and more pain, more fear, more fear, more, more decrease in performance because you're afraid to put weight on the bar yep. and you're injured. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and again, to be clear, so then people say, yeah, well, I did do a squat and my knees did come in. Wasn't the pain coming from my medial meniscus? Can't say that. No. You may have had no susceptive stimuli. Yeah. Pain comes from your brain. Yes, correct. Always, every time. We with just, Sometimes paired with peripheral inputs to the brain, but yeah. contextualized in the environment and correct. based on prior experiences and expectations. So not reliably does the peripheral stimuli ne you know, necessarily That's carry true. over and to the And you can have experience. it with, without the perception of pain. Sure. You know, it's context dependent. Right? I think we should just start lesioning folks' anterior cingulate, you know, see what happens. <laughs> burn it out. Well, so here's the other side of this equation. It's like, are we... On the, on the opposite extreme of being like complete movement nihilists where like nothing matters because people come to these seminars and yeah, we coach them on the squat and the bench and the deadlift. So sure. what are we doing? Why are we, why are we bothering to do that? Why don't we just say, yeah, just go do whatever you want. It's two yeah. separate conversations. You have the pain conversation and you have performance conversation. Okay. And they're, they're very separate conversations. I agree that entirely. And that's the justification that we use when we explain this is why are we teaching you this technique or why are we cueing you on things? And we are doing that because we see it as a way to, because you are presumably here because you want to lift more weight or lift that weight for more reps. Some, some, some marker of performance would like to improve. And we think we're giving you recommendations uh, on things that we think could help you achieve those goals. And yeah. of course there are times where sometimes we'll try something like that and they're like, no, I didn't like that at all. I'm like, all right, let's back it up and go, go right. backwards. So yeah. the recommendations targeted towards performance, but they're not recommendations framed within the guise of, Oh, if you don't do it this way, that yeah. critical step. Just One weird trick. To, yes. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise right your knee is going to explode. Your back's going to explode. I mean, all these things have been said to patients. I remember when we cited that, uh, I forget which account it was that had the, the, the picture Exploding of the guy bending spine. over. He's bending over with a round back to pick up a tennis ball off the floor and he has a mushroom cloud drawn coming Sweet. out of his spine. Sounds amazing. Yeah. These are the things that people I get told. And, you know, I first. think that on the other side of this conversation, people who don't necessarily buy into this are probably like, ah, this is like a bunch of touchy feely bullshit. Like this is this, you know. Sure. Minus but the evidence. But we do lots of rehab stuff. People, I mean, I was getting so much stuff that I asked Mike and Derek to come help us because I was like, I don't have time to do all this. And now they're helping us with our rehab consults. And they tell me a lot of the things that they're seeing among these folks. And this past week, he was like, the biggest thing that I'm seeing among all these people that are coming to us with aches and pains is a crazy hypervigilance to, yeah. tech, to technique. I would a call it perfectionism. Yeah. Uh, yeah for, for sure. Like. People have it in their heads that there's this one perfect way to do an exercise. Mm -hmm. and if they don't do it, that's why they're having symptoms. Mm -hmm. Do you call that like a model for exercise? Yes. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So the less uh, 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 well that you adhere to this model, your perception of threat goes way up. Right. Well, it's the idea that either, you know, somebody who I hold in a position of authority, my coach, it has to see every single rep I do and is going to give me a cue to make sure that every single rep I do looks perfect. completely perfect and identical because if there's any deviation, then I'm presumably putting myself at risk. And this is what he's having to undo yeah. on these people who are coming in to sure. pain. And they're like, what? Like you're telling me that like, you know, I can move in different ways and it's not necessarily the way I'm moving, but it might be something else that we'll talk about in a little yeah. bit here yeah. that can be. I like the way that you move. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Worked very hard. Right? Yeah. You're right. It's, it's pretty good. But I, but we've been talking about this. I mean, our, both of our, I think we had Instagram posts the last week where we're basically like, yo, technique, what do? Yeah. And then we, we discussed, we both, you know, all this stuff that from an injury prevention standpoint, we find the connection to be very, very minimal, right. if any. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I won't even say prevention because we're never going to prevent anything. Like we'll do risk reduction, but that's going to be about the best that sure. we get. Yeah. yeah. That's a better, yeah. Because injuries are going to happen regardless. Yeah. Uh, we all know people who have what we consider to be beautiful, flawless technique, who have you know, recurrent injury, chronic injury, or, you know, shit happens sometimes. It's yeah. part of the game. Yeah. I mean, uh, life. 
Right. It's like, a risk no matter what. The, the question is, is like, is it a risk you're willing to take? And the benefits far outweigh the risk as far as exercise goes. We sure. have too many positives. But not only is it just risk, but the attributable risk to pull out Ooh, some yeah, statistics. All right. What's up, step two? What can, yeah. what, what are the actual risk factors? What can we attribute that risk to? So right now it sounds like we're shifting our attribution of that risk away from mobility problems right. or from technical problems or, you know, moving quote unquote incorrectly, mm-hmm. whatever that means, even though it's impossible it's to define. It's a good you way to, at any level to of, at any level of competition. You go to any gym, you see thousands of different ways of performing an exercise, uh, seemingly with low injury rates. You know, it's right. interesting, like 2014, I just remember I was texting Wolf, like I had just pulled 600 and for the first time and uh, my back was, I mean, it was pretty rounded, you know, because sure. that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So it's a strategy. <laughs> and uh, somebody had asked, they saw the video, this was actually at a seminar and they were like, you know, your back was rounded. Like, how are you here? I'm like, you didn't it, implode? Like, no, right I actually took weight. Like I did multiple sets of five afterwards and then yeah. benched and then squatted because, you know went on living my life because it was yeah and they were like but doesn't your back hurt and i'm like no you know I, and then, it? <laughs> well, you're right so I, started, I was texting wolf right and uh, i remember telling him i was like i actually don't think that like doing the deadlift with great technique reduces people having back pain you know i think deadlifting in and of itself is a good thing for people with back pain to get yeah. them you know, this is very, my very early, like exposure to any sort of pain science, sure. you know? And he's like, I don't know, man. Like, I feel like if you do a deadlift wrong, like pain is going to increase. What's wrong? Man? Well, right. That's what I said. I was like, I don't know. I think people do deadlifts wrong all the time and are just fine. And then there are people who do deadlifts great and still have back pain. I feel like it's unrelated. And I'm not saying that he was, you know, hundred percent wrong. We just, we didn't know what we didn't know at yeah, the right. time. Yeah, but right. th- my initial suspicion was just anecdotally you see people with wide varieties of technique yes. okay it's some that you would say that's wrong i know that it's wrong because your back is actively going from like flat to flexion like active movement under load sure. and most people would say mm, that's wrong right like or if your knees for, for on a squat for instance caved in and touched sure. would we rather that those things maybe didn't happen from a performance oh, standpoint 100% but yeah. from a, a sure. injury risk reduction standpoint, we can't I, say. I can't make that argument in good no. faith unless I wanted to sell you something. And now for my low, low, pro- <laughs> no, like I just, I don't have the stretching program to sell you. Yeah. I don't have the rebuild your squat program to sell you because I can't do that ethically. Yeah. I think what's happened, I mean, because we used to think similarly before we knew what we knew. Sure. And, but when we were still kind of rooted in the same way, lay public thinks about pain. Um, and I think you know, we've had to change our mind over time when we realized a how pain works and B that we were doing harm to people yes. by putting yes. these ideas in their head. And so now we're trying to liberate them from these ideas and make them less fearful because, you know, you talk about the example of a deadlift, like for most people who don't train, it's a scary movement it has the word dead in it. Right. It's right? called lift. Yeah. Just call them, call them pickup, <laughs> call them pickups. Yeah. Pickups. Who, so they don't, so they don't have to be you know, yeah. afraid of it. If they're a rehab patient or something like that. It's like diabetes. But, but we're putting diabetes. all this fear of like, you know, you, you know, you have this tiny little bit of, of, uh, of spinal flexion and your discs are going to squirt out your back or something ridiculous like that. Yeah, but that's you know? because someone gave them that narrative. Well, that Very, used to be us. Yeah. Yeah. We used to say, if you round your back, you know, you might have more back. Oh yeah. Back it, pain. Make sure you don't round used your back. to be all of us at some yeah, point. I was yeah. say, it wouldn't have been just you guys. Like that's the collective mindset. Sure. Know? Yeah. So we're fighting against it. We're meeting, of course, typical resistance that, that I would expect, but. You know, I think that we're building building our force and Some making t- hopefully a more convincing case over time. Well, this all just the the dangerous thing is you're in, you're encroaching on people's territory from a market standpoint because if we maintained that having pristine technique, uh, not only reduced injury but also was corrective of something for like people's you know, pain experiences, do you realize how powerful that is as a sales tool? Saying, yeah, no, you're dead. The reason why you have back pain is because you're deadlifting wrong. Oh, you're not deadlifting? Well, because you're not deadlifting. We have an answer for yeah, everything. Just confirm. Right? Right. Each thing right. confirms your <laughs> Exactly. But instead we're saying you don't need to see this movement expert to teach you how to squat or deadlift because, you know. Well, now you're taking away titles. And- well, that's what I'm saying though. So, so if we maintain that you have to do it with this exquisite form and we hold the keys to right. it because we coach, we're these expert level coaches, right. we corner the market. Now, if we say, hey, you know what? You're a trainer. You've got 
some programming knowledge and you're continuing your education, it's okay for you to like not be as great of a movement coach because you're 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 doing more ben- you're causing more benefit than harm by you're getting people to train, you're right. encouraging them to make lifestyle changes, and yeah, just because their background's a little bit or their knees move in a little bit on the squat from a performance standpoint, sure you're costing them a little some pounds on the bar, but you're not hurting them. Right. Where and before perfectly, we would say we we're hurting them. It's and it's perfectly possible to emphasize the same things from a technical execution exactly. standpoint you want if you just frame it differently. Yes, 100%. So you could you could have the people <laughs> move in the way you want them to move. If we all agreed that there was a mechanically advantageous way to lift the load from the ground, sure. then we can frame that appropriately. Which I think there we would we would probably think that there is. Yes, yes. I think yes. we have evidence of that. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's just when you're saying you don't need to see a movement specialist, a highly trained no. coach for safety reasons. Right. Well, that that can hurt somebody's market. And then you're completely saying the corrective exercise thing is tomfoolery it is it's bullshit all right well what, what i'm getting at is that this threatens multiple yeah, sure. different fields within our strength conditioning field yeah. now, i'm okay doing that like i feel comfortable <laughs> doing that yeah. but i understand why there is such a resistance because you're talking about people you know people's lunch money yeah and uh that's why they have this vitriol and they can't you're asking we're asking people who are making a living off of this model to say to reject it we just saw, and it's not even just like, uh, it's not just our, no, it's not just us, right? We don't have evidence to say, like, there's not a research study that says, if you do this movement this way, it's guaranteed this injury is going to happen. Like, we sure. just don't, it doesn't, doesn't exist. exist you know? It doesn't exist. Yeah. So speaking of evidence, great segue. What, what do we have? Yeah. What right. do we have for like variables that we should be either tracking or focusing on that would reduce uh, the injury risk? So we only have a couple things, I mean, which is good because it's things that we can focus on. But um, and we have a lot of data on this stuff. One but, less thing, right? Exactly. Just one weird trick. Here we go. Um, <laughs> right. <already. laughs> well, so to frame the discussion real quick, so so from a technical execution standpoint, as it pertains to injury risk, we have effectively no evidence. None. No. Despite the massive emphasis that's put on its significance for injury risk reduction. So if we could say because we have nothing to substantiate this entire argument, let's shift that passionate emphasis we have about te- technique for the purpose of risk reduction yeah. and shift it to this other area where we have lots of data, lots yeah. of supportive data that has been to date ignored by I, our scene in general. I think the people like that we that may feel threatened by what we're saying, these would be the things that I would want to pe- see people shift their focus to. Yes, for that, sure. Yes. If you're worried about like, well, how do I make money in this field now? Well, here's what the research evidence says. What we should be focused mm-hmm. on sure. as coaches and trainers. Yeah. All right, so let's do it. Where are we, where are we going to kick it off with? So the first thing I would say is most important uh, would be load management and fatigue management. So load management, we obviously have to define like what is load, what is fatigue. So Eckerd et al. came out with the latest review on this, looking at loading of the athlete, which can be defined a couple different ways. You have internal loading and you have external loading. Um, you also have absolute and relative, which we don't have to necessarily get into in this podcast. But internal loading would be the subjective loading of the person, of the athlete participating in whatever the event is, whether so, it's like... It sounds like session RPE. It is. We're gonna, that's what we're getting to for sure. And, and session RPE, kind of a quick aside, is probably the one variable that we should all be tracking on. Everyone is the most supported internal intensity rating that we have currently. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's some resistance to using RPE because, you know, for whatever reason. The deal is session RPE along with regular RPE, it's always there. It's always, even if you use it or not, it's that value that in that perception of whatever that value would have been, should you actually written down the number yeah. is always there. You know, if the session was, you know, mm-hmm. that was a 10 out of 10, right? even that if you didn't write down right. in your journal 10, right? you know, oof, so just to just to clearly define for folks who are not familiar with the terminology, so they're probably used to hearing us talk about RPE in the context of a sort of a reps and reserve kind of deal when prescribing training loads. A session RPE, which is the specific variable we're talking about tracking, refers to a subjective rating of the uh, dif- the difficulty of that training session. The whole session. So yep. as, a, as a whole, if you could summate the, Zero to the total stress of yep. that session, you'd say that session was a 7 out of 10 session or a 9 out of 10 session. That was the hardest session I've ever done. It was 10 out of 10 session. So right. you rate it like that, and that represents your internal training load, i.e. the subjective perception of how difficult that was. Right. Yes. And that is not a trivial thing it uh, is, for, for many reasons. It is the most important that we have thus far. Yeah. And there is... And there is a substantial amount of 
data again to support yeah. this. So just to make that clear. Yeah, Eckerd basically came out this year and was like, we had emerging evidence where we were saying there is a correlation. At this point, it's no longer emerging. It is established evidence mm -hmm. that this is solid data that we should be tracking this variable. So yeah. we think that that has a uh, causative relationship in terms yep. of if you have consistent session RPE ratings that are too high. That was a hard session on, I've ever had. You come in on Monday and it's a nine out of 10 session. Yep. You come in on Wednesday, it's a nine out of 10 session. You come in on Friday and it's a nine out of 10 session. You come back Monday again, nine out of 10 sessions. It's not gonna end well. Grind it out. And that's yep. what we observe. These but, are people we are now rehabbing. Yep. Well, but no, you just have to keep going because yep. if you don't, then just keep you're, a bad, to the bar. you're a bad person. And right. you know, yeah. so the this we have substantial looking. evidence uh, <laughs> I think I think on this matter, and uh, it basically you you said something that I liked when we were talking about this uh, yesterday. You said basically that any approach to uh, programming that fails to take into account the athlete's subjective kind of internal metrics or their 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 internal uh, internal load, their subjective assessment of of difficulty of training training load uh, is limited. And yeah. is going to do a poor job at fatigue management, and there, and and consequently uh, r reducing injury risk. I, I look at it just like a pain discussion. Like you're leaving out the human. You're mm -hmm. basically like, here's this program, go run it, and you're irrelevant as the person who's running the program. Mm -hmm. right. It doesn't it's less make any adaptable sense. to the person. Well, right. it it kind of flows contrary to the traditional ideas uh, of periodization that emerged from this kind of overly simplistic. Uh, Cellie kind of model that oh. we, we that's been discussed stress recovery Kylie talks about it in the literature I talk yeah. about it in 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 the lecture where you have this predict very very clearly uh, very, uh both in terms of degree and temporality uh predictable stress response and adaptation cycle where you know that you start here and end here repeatedly like yeah. the body's like a machine that will respond if only. in a predictive manner to this training load and that's yeah. not how biology works to be clear that is bullshit and you right. eventually break yeah. To be it's clear, that, that model is bullshit. Yeah. yeah. To, I get, YouTube, I, I want <laughs> you to know that the people who are telling you that are lying to you. They're fibbing. Yeah. They've made up their own narrative of logic that they are now feeding you at your expense. And your only option is to reject it. <laughs> we can right along. We can we can cite the papers in the sure. show notes. Kyle, yeah, it's there. Because it's not, I, w I want to make it clear that it's not just us that's saying this. No, it's like, look, when we read this the first time, we're like, nah. Yeah. We read it the second time, we're like, Nah. And then third time we're like, but all right, change and our minds. Would, yeah, <laughs> it's just it will get the overwhelming amount of evidence yeah. that that really it, it will changes your perception too. Because you know you'll have people say, I've been a coach for you know x you know twenty years, and I've had all these people, and this is the way we always do it. And it's like, well, one, that's not true. You're forgetting about all the people who've blown up along the way, right? All the yeah. bodies, okay. And and then that does this even work better than average? Because if it did, right? If you actually had a program that worked remarkably well okay and better than anything published publish a case report right it that doesn't exist it's not gonna happen we and you know so anyway all right so the first thing training load subjective internal training load yeah can you differentiate that so that so you mentioned internal load and external yeah, load. so we have external next well the other part of internal would be rir which is reps and reserves some people like to use that some people combine rpe with rir and then external training load would be any external stimulus that's used to apply to the athlete so them physically doing work to do uh, resistance against external load. And this could be a lot of different things. Um, external intensity could be looked at like if you're a sprint based athlete, the, the time that it takes you to complete a sprint, that would be an example of the intensity. The terrain that you're completing the sprint on, that would be an example of intensity for external. Um, if it's a barbell athlete, it's going to be the load on the barbell, the weight being lifted. That would be external literally intensity. the external load, right? That's being <laughs> in that, in that context, right? Yeah. So yeah. you'd be the you'd like your heaviest weights, so you're that tonnage, yeah, and then and then the actual time of the entire training session. The only reason I know this is because yeah. we've been working on some templates and yes. so seeing these new variables. Yeah. Uh, so that, I think you're tying into the. Uh, do you want to go into the yeah, workload so you have, ratios? You here? have um, absolute and relative intensities as well um, that are loading the athlete. So absolute, um, if I recall correctly, the way Eckerd defines it is looking at broad time. And then relative is looking at two different time points comparatively. And this is where acute on chronic workload ratios come into play, which is uh, Tim Gabbett's the big name for this stuff. Where acute, uh, we define acute as just this either single bout for a single athlete 
if it's a team-based sport athlete, it's usually a week worth of training. Sure. And then chronic would be the average of the previous three to four weeks. And this gets a little complicated. You can have like uncoupled and coupled. But so what are we talking about? The unit of measurement here is session RPE times minutes of training. So to give, let's, let's give a concrete example. So let's yes, say so. you're doing a three day a week training program and you do your heaviest session of the week on Monday. It takes you two hours to finish. After you finish, that was the hardest session you've ever done in your entire life. You rated a session RPE of 10. Yep. And you multiply two hours, that by 120 minutes yep. and you get this arbitrary unit. 1200, 1200 AUs. AUs. Yeah. Right. And so in the research literature is because I've been asked about this. It is just arbitrary units. Yeah. It's like just a number. Yes. Just treat it as a, a that is it. Yeah. yeah. And you compare that to the average of that number over the prior three to four weeks of training. So right. you're comparing what you just did Correct. compared to what you arguably should be adapted to right. in recent history. So a Q is um, basically like your snapshot of fitness. Mm -hmm. And then chronic is your snapshot. Well, chronic is your snapshot of fitness. Acute is a snapshot of fatigue. Mm -hmm. So you have this initial bout of fatigue compared to your overall um, fitness level. Mm -hmm. And what you want to see is that you're adapted to do the thing you're about to do. Like in most simplistic terms, I could put this. If you were going to go in and deadlift 500 pounds, I sure as shit hope you've deadlifted 100, 200, 300, 400, 450, 475 leading up to it. So your chronic fitness level has been progressively going up to get you ready to do 500 pounds. So when you have that acute spike, you're able to handle it. Mm -hmm. But if you went in and you'd never deadlifted anywhere close to it, the most you've done is 350 and you're like, fuck it, we're going for 500 today. It's probably not going to end well. That's going to be a massive acute spike of your fatigue levels compared to your fitness levels. And that's what we don't want to see. Which you might be just fine, particularly if the rep doesn't go and you just kind of, you know, <laughs> Right, if it doesn't it. budge off the ground. A better example yeah. might be doing a rep max effort or something like that if you're unaccustomed to doing something Yeah, like something that. that's yeah. doable, but the the acute stress actually goes away because you're able to complete sure. some, of, some of the reps. All you're, all you're used to doing is, you know, three or four sets on a particular exercise and you come in and you're going to do 10 sets of 10. Yeah. On yeah. A given or all you're used that to doing a substantial is acute spike 75 to 80 percent and then you jack it up to you know 85 90 yeah. percent and yeah. you do a bunch of that mm -hmm. or external stress from the environment has been layered on top of your training stress which just magnifies that's the interesting side of this thing is when you when you consider internal training load uh the session rpe or how difficult you perceive a training session to be that's going to be modulated or influenced by lots of things, not just what you did in that training session. If it was only related to what you did in that training session, then really all you're measuring is just external load. Yeah. Right. But it can be affected by all your life stress, your sleep situation, how, Which how, well, RPE is factored in. Yeah, yeah. how, how well fed you are, what, what else is going on in your life, whether you just did a 28 hour call shift. All right. So, what you, what so all you, that stuff factors in and it can make things feel harder in the yeah. same way that it can affect diet outcomes we just talked about sure, that dietary rp yeah well so I, I you know you guys know i'm on board right i'm with you what do you say to the claim that you guys just making things complicated just to make them complicated i think it's simplifying things i mean it gives us an objective way of looking at this stuff as best as we can and regulating training accordingly so i think it simplifies things versus like you just going in and beating your head against the wall every day trying to be better thinking that's going to be the answer to your problems. But well, sure. If you just work hard enough and you keep doing the same thing that failed to work the last 10 times, you probably... <laughs> I think they right call right. that insanity, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, do you have any response to that? The Austin well, I mean, so we're, if, if the topic that we're discussing is injury risk, sure. then I would vehemently agree that it's a simplification when we leave the land of your joints must be perfectly aligned and stacked in this exact manner and you must move in this very specific way, yeah, which is a very complex very complicated thing. Yeah. And we're shifting it towards there's this degree of movement, freedom and adaptability and you can handle being in various positions and things like that. Yeah. But we just need to monitor and manage how hard this thing is and keep it in a sweet spot zone. Like yeah. that seems... Which yeah. it gets really interesting. So like uh, if you, I encourage everyone to go read this article because it's actually it's really good. It's really, really well written and it's, it's not overly complex by Eckhart Adele. But they talk about the U-shaped relationship to acute on chronic workload ratios. Yeah, I read that. And so the interesting part of this is like uh, on the one side we were just talking about, are you trained enough to do what you're trying to do, which is the chronic fitness level. On the other side of that is you can be undertrained, and so you're not prepared to go do the things that you're trying to do. So this is where we got on the opposite side. So like... Gabby gives a sweet spot, uh, and this is debatable, but 0.8 to 1.3. It's for like team sports mostly. Right. And, and this is where like soccer players, rugby, football, stuff like that. This is where we, we really have data applied to team-based sport athletes. 
But if you drop below that 0.8, it means you're probably not conditioned enough to go out and do the things you want to do. And we see injuries go up. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, if you get above 1.3, then you're probably doing too much and you're not allowing time for recovery. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a legit concern that you should pay attention to. Yeah, don't be too extra. Sure. There's something to be said about this sort of gradual progressive overload that actually allows you to adapt to. Combined with managing fatigue. Right. Yeah. Which simple. There's a difference things. between progressive overload and progressive overload plus managing fatigue. Well, sure. Yeah, right. I agree. And you, know, you can blindly progressively overload until something breaks. Well, that's the easy thing to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But doing yeah. so in a way that you can continue to do so for years on end. That's, Longevity, that's, hopefully. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's how so so you have you have these two possible situations uh, by which you can become a relatively high performer. Right. Hopefully you're operating with reasonably good genetic stock. Right. But the two possibilities are one, you're the freak who no matter what somebody throws at you, they don't get injured. And I've coached some people like that. I can just th throw massive amounts of training at them and never, it's never see an injury out of them. I'm like, yeah. okay, sweet. That makes my job easy. Yep. But there's the other person who is not that person. Right. But if you manage fatigue appropriately and you get them to train productively for a decade, then they can potentially end up in a great spot. Yeah. You know, and, and perform relatively well, which, you know, even though I've had ups and downs throughout my training career, for example, with various tendinopathies and stuff that I've had to work through, I think that overall the fatigue management, my training has worked generally well to get me at least to where I am now, which is a different place than I think I would have ended up in had I never learned anything about fatigue management. Yeah. I actually have been trying to kill Austin for the last, you know, 16, <laughs> 20 weeks <laughs> unsuccessfully. That darned RPE. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what other, what other things do you think we ought to be tracking, if anything, based on the current research evidence as it pertains to sport injury? So I think that covers like load management pretty well. Um, another paper would be Jones et al. that talks about fatigue management, which goes hand in hand with mm -hmm. managing load appropriately. Um, and there's some interesting data on with, that goes with fatigue. It's not just phys physical uh, fatigue, but it's mental fatigue, which would be the next thing we get into. But we have research on like uh, on college athletes during final exam times or midterms, we mm -hmm. actually see illness and injuries spike up. Mm -hmm. And it's because this isn't a physical loading time period. This is actually a mental loading time period, mm -hmm. which is equally as relevant. And we see uh, injury and illness go up with physical loading as well during times of competitive status for the athlete. So Iverson et al. has a, a really good systematic review on the psychosocial correlates to injury risk reduction. We so the other... Part of this is that we should be managing uh, athletes' ability to cope with life, whether it's life stressors, financial stressors, family, yeah. you whatever. Get to, you get to leverage social support structures so right. that they have more options and more avenues to ultimately improve their yeah. ability to tolerate stress. Yeah. I, mean, we, I talked about the same thing today in the diet, the obesity lecture, and the nutrition part, like leveraging that so that you can, if you're trying to lean on someone and you know to make changes or to do something that's intense or challenging they need these support structures and if they don't have those in place they can't cope yeah. so mental stress will bleed over and affect the amount of stress that you're, you're developing from a given training load or task load sure yeah, yeah. that can be summatively kind of uh categorized under the allostatic load no, concept no that's not that's not a thing not, not a real <laughs> thing yeah no just the summation of the total kind of psychological, social, and biological stress. I mean, hell, this sounds like pain again. It's <laughs> yeah. kind of odd how that works. My favorite part of that uh, Kylie paper was talking about allostatic residues. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that every allostatic, you know, perturbation that you've had is left a little... Leaves an imprint. A little mark. Yeah. A little fossil, if you will. Allostatic yeah. fossil. It's like Jurassic Park going on. It's great. I think the, and this is something that we've been, Jordan and I have been talking about recently as how, because you just said it sounds a lot like, uh, a lot like pain, but fatigue is a, is a physical symptom that we perceive yeah. in a similar way yeah. to pain. I know we've talked about this. And, you know, we've, we've talked a lot before um, about a uh, central governor model of fatigue and things like that. And basically the idea that <laughs> fatigue is something that is produced by your brain. Sure. In order to prevent you from redlining it, in, don't kill harm, yourself. harming yourself. Should we define so, fatigue? Probably. It's three different types of fatigue: peripheral fatigue, central fatigue, muscular damage. That's how we typically describe summative fatigue. You could wrap that all in a little bow. That which 
reduces performance. It's a decrement from baseline performance, yeah. pretty much. And it's, yeah. you're not returning quickly back to baseline level. But as, a, but, as a, but as a symptom, in similar way to pain, you can view it as, a, as just another example of a protective mechanism yeah. of your brain from harming yourself. And so fatigue is there for a reason. Uh, and that's why we need to manage it and not ignore it and just kind of like put our heads down and suck that shit up and get it done. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Turn that, that works well. <laughs> old school. <laughs> well, this has been fascinating. Uh, do you guys want to, uh, wrap this up with, uh, you know, the what to do pain injury? Yeah. So what do you do when you experience pain or injury? Oh, shit. Um, my question he's given all the way to seek all the secrets away right now uh, like there's all the money that's right i mean i think my shirt says it all what are you gonna do not train well, <laughs> it's a, a good fan. looking shirt yeah, you know yeah. yeah um i think the first thing is just reassurance if this is the coach or the clinician that pain doesn't necessarily mean that there's an injury or tissue damage is there any cause for concern that would be step number one mm -hmm. and then once we can get through that then figuring out what are you capable of currently where you're at whether this is from a objective or subjective side of things and then getting you to do those things and engage it and not be fear avoidant and then slowly build you back up to where we had you at or past it. So expose, expose yourself to those things yep. that you deem as painful or threatening. Yep. But so I hurt myself deadlifting 500. Do you want me you to, need to expose deadlift. myself to go deadlift 500? Not necessarily 500. You know, we can regulate load back down, you know, control the external intensity uh -huh. and then get you to do that. And, slowly over time increase intensity again but i think if, if there's a fear avoidance that i deadlifted and because the deadlift uh i correlated with pain perception you could set yourself up for failure but i felt some pressure in my back i felt something slip in my back yeah snap city so but it's not reliable yeah so so not, what do i your do now perception of what you're feeling isn't a reliable estimate of what actually is happening my back feels tight it's all right go move you'll be good but I don't have anything. <laughs> I, I, I mean, what, one of the main things that I wish I could have done to a younger version of myself is to care less yeah. uh, about, you know, these little things, you know, that would, I, oh, my knees hurt less well, because they're sliding forward at the bottom of the squat. Or if I ever do a high bar squat or front squat, my knees are going to explode because they're moving too far forward. Or if I, you know, all these things that I could, you know, work myself up about. But somebody set that expectation somewhere. And oh, that's, I, I that's, know. That's oh, one of my things. I was like, there for that. <laughs> I, I think if we were to broad frame this out, like just on the topic of pain, uh, especially cl clinicians, most especially, we're probably perpetuating the per persistent pain epidemic that we're dealing with because of these narratives. Like we're setting people up to failure. We're True. making them think like, oh, you deadlift and you got back pain. Just don't deadlift again or don't deadlift as much weight or don't do this. Like we are setting the expectation that that was the causative issue. And that's what they're going to, if they go do it again, then the expectation is they're going to get pain out of it again at some point. And then we're kind of perpetuating this fear of wooden cycle. Yeah. Well, so some of the examples that you described are things that sometimes can manifest as, as tendinopathy, which we were talking about yesterday. It's like yeah. this hugely complex topic. And in some ways, I mean, I don't know, to what extent do you think that tendinopathy needs a somewhat unique approach compared to some of these other, well, I, I mean, it's, it's still just, it's still pain, yeah. right? But I can't help but feel like there's something different about it. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, I've, I've heard this before. Um, and, and not just from you, but from other <laughs> people as well, as far as tendinopathies go. My approach isn't different. So even if I'm dealing with any issue of pain perception, it's still we're going to engage it. We're going to mm -hmm. engage the threatening behavior. Yeah. That's the only way that we can desensitize you to it. It's, it's exposure-based therapy. You know, It's cognitive behavioral therapy as well. And so when we do that, the expectation isn't pain-free. The expectation is with tolerable level of the symptoms, yeah. which is the next question is, well, what's tolerable? I don't know. That's very individualistic. You tell me. Yeah. yeah. You have to tell me how much can you tolerate. And sure. every day is probably different. The caveat is I don't want you leaving this session or any training session feeling debilitated. Like you can't go to the out to your car, leave and do everything else you need to do in that day. It's totally wrecked you. That's not a good thing. It doesn't mean you've hurt yourself it's or your really tissues damaged. Ever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that, get whether it's wrecked. tendinopathy or, what's that? Get wrecked, bro. Right, get wrecked. Whether it's tendinopathy <laughs> or anything. <laughs> uh, if we're dealing with any pain perception, that's how I approach it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think tendinopathy is unique to that. That probably is where the first time people really started hearing about the idea of, I need to engage symptoms, mm -hmm. probably was through tendinopathy research. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the expectation early on with the research was set, 
this is going to be uncomfortable. You've just got to embrace it. So we mm-hmm. set that expectation. And then the other one would be that you don't want to see symptoms spiked and last for 24 hours. So the thought process behind tendinopathies is it is a loading based issue. But I think I've maintained for a number of years now that an atraumatic musculoskeletal injury is probably a loading based issue. Can we we say that again slowly? Yeah. An atraumatic, meaning that you did not experience a substantial trauma or any trauma, like you didn't take a a helmet to the the knee or or you didn't get hit by a car or fall off your bike or your motorcycle or whatever. So no trauma, it just kind of arose. This pain or quote unquote injury just came, it arose in the course of training. Yep. Musculoskeletal, so just like soft tissue based injury, muscle, Mm -hmm. ligament, uh, tendon, um, is a training based or load management based issue. That's how I would approach it. Including the examples that you listed before, if you develop knee pain in the course of the squat and things like that, it's more likely to be that the, the structures involved were inadequately prepared to do what, uh, they, to to do do. what they needed to do under that particular load. And it's likely that there exists a load under which they can do their job and you yeah. have to train them up and desensitize them uh, to handle things with that pain. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's, that's just not tendinopathy research. I think that applies yes, to, I agree. Yeah. 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 I didn't hear you say that there was like a deficit of like full rolling. Yes. Or like theragunning. Too many adhesions. You need to get those released or to, tie things up other things that we don't necessarily prescribe when it comes to uh, injury management in the course of the gym is just taking very high doses of NSAIDs yeah. for a few days and changing nothing else about your training. Sure. Because effectively you, you put you're doing a, nothing, a bad bandaid on a systemic problem. Yeah. The systemic problem is your training, yep. not your load, technique, load management, but your like programming that. is right. the problem. Right. When you should switch that. And we have ways that you can do that. I've also heard like caloric surplus is one I've heard recently as Unfortunately, well. Unfortunately. No evidence to support whatsoever. that. Whatsoever. None. Yes. Because yeah. you would expect people with who have obesity to have lower incidences. They should never get injured. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a reported that's injury. A good, that's a a reported injury, osteoarthritis, or tendinopathies. But in fact, you see the opposite relationship. Yeah. If you are obese, that is one of the biggest it's risk, a risk factors. factor. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you just got to eat your so, way. So, 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 so that's what we're trying to do is shift all this unnecessary emphasis on interventions for pain and injury that have no substantiating evidence and that generally don't tend to work all that well. It's fear mongering, typically. Yes, we would agree at this point. And (coughs) shift that emphasis onto things that we do have evidence for and that do tend to work far more reliably in practice, I think. So load management. Start using session RP. Even if you're not going to use it to manage your programming right now, you're going to need to track for four weeks anyway to get some sort of baseline data on like what you actually are adapted to right now is evidence by you were able to do this for four weeks and not right. explode. So that's, and then on the fifth week, only then can you compare the weekly average of these arbitrary units to the previous four weeks. Right. That'd be very useful. But you should start rating your session RPE, record your training time. Even if you don't, I mean, even if you don't go through, if, if, the, if even that is too complex for you, yeah. sure. let me, let me give that example. Cause there's some math involved there. You're talking about arbitrary units. I don't know what that means. Even if that's too complex for you, if you just make a note in your training log session of how hard that session was measured. and you notice that the numbers are high consistently, consistently weeks on end, yeah. do something different, yep. right? I mean, and, and I've talked about this before when I, for one, the, the only period of time in my training career when I was burned out and almost wanted to quit, I was doing a certain training program that in retrospect had me hitting 10 out of 10 session RPEs, yeah. basically twice a week, every week for like three months. Yeah. And I dreaded to. going to the gym I went to. and I enough, dreaded bro. the next workout at the other end of the week. Yeah. And I was like, this is terrible. And I developed what was ultimately diagnosed as patellofemoral knee pain at the time, nice. which is just a diagnosis called, knee pain, called knee pain. Yeah. Uh, didn't know where it came from. I got x-rays, saw an orthopedist. He told me to squat to parallel, no deeper. Man, this rabbit hole so is getting worse. I went, I went all through this stuff. Yeah, you know. And in retrospect, now I know so much more about the process, and yeah. I know that the problem was not with the fact that I was squatting below parallel and not to parallel. It was not my technique. It was that my training load management was absolutely terrible. So it's non-existent. Every session was ten out of ten. Well, because you just had to do more. Yeah, I'm it's hard, just, I was, it's just I was, I was, I was like, hardcore, man. You were sure. going to break yourself. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, otherwise you just. Would have squatted your way all the way to a thousand, like everybody. Oh, that's <laughs> not how it works. <laughs> Interesting how that works out. Okay, well, hey, I think that's all we got. I think we have. Yeah.
wrap that up. Very so good. very thankful for the, again, the second most handsome doctor in North America, Dr. Baraki for joining us, Michael Ray. I guess I'm third. <laughs> uh, you are number one. I'm number. You're three. moving up the ranks very rapidly. <laughs> That's right. Uh, for all of us here at Barbell Medicine, thank you for tuning in. If you could leave us a review on iTunes, that would be most helpful. If you're not subscribed yet to our YouTube channel, please subscribe for updates on all the latest content. We'll see you guys next time. Uh, do you want to tell people what kind of animal you would be? You don't want to like get your brain going like that. No. The question is why are manhole covers round? That was a Google question. Okay. They couldn't get if they were square. <laughs> it's something to do with uh, removal and replacement. Yeah. Ease of removal and ease of replacement. When, yeah, when you when you pull them out, they won't fall into the thing. Oh, because it'll just like get kind of swivel in there. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to adjust it as a square. You are not hireable by Google. Fortunately, I'm perfectly satisfied. Not working. That's where you're wrong. <laughs> this podcast brought to you by Google. <laughs> the only search engine that matters. Google. For when you want other people to know your life and they're tracking you anyway. <laughs>